morning. This is Talking Animals on WMNF. I'm Duncan Strauss, and my guest today is Dr. Michael Maria Delgado, a certified cat behavior consultant and animal behavior scientist. Delgado is also an author, most recently, of Play With Your Cat, the essential guide to interactive play for a happier, healthier feline. If I were to say Delgado really knows cats, I'd mean it in the usual way, sure, but also in a decidedly academic sense. She completed her PhD in animal behavior and cognition at UC Berkeley and was a postdoctoral fellow at the UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine where she researched the social and feeding behavior of cats and the health and behavior of orphaned neonatal kittens. Her previous book was Total Cat Mojo, co-written with Jackson Galaxy. In this new book, Play With Your Cat, Legato is an enthusiastic, bordering on an insistent advocate for playing with your cat or cats. Drawing on her own extensive research as well as a string of scientific studies, Delgado discusses the importance of play to all cats' health and well-being, instructs readers on how to engage their cats in play across all ages, even offers guidance on which kinds of toys are best and why. I live with cats most of my life, and I found Delgado's book eye-opening, and you might too. We'll discuss play with your cats and more when I speak with Dr. Michael Maria Delgado in just a moment here on Talking Animals on WMF. Meanwhile, coming up later in today's program, we'll reprise the animal news segment, which used to be a fixture of this show, but has often been replaced by a short second interview or other kinds of programming. For today, though, we bring back the animal news later here on Talking Animals on WMNF. Right now, though, let's discuss the importance of playing with your cat with Dr. Michael Maria Delgado, who truly wrote the book on it. With a reminder that I invite you to join the conversation by calling 813-239-9663, emailing dj at wmnf.org, or texting 813-433-0885. Let's welcome Dr. Michael Maria Delgado to Talking Animals on WMNF. Good morning, Dr. Delgado. Hi, Duncan. Thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us on Talking Animals, and um, can hardly wait to sort of dive into the book as, as I uh, you know, noted at uh, Social Post and just now here elsewhere. Uh, after a lifetime living with a cat, your key directives to play with your cat were eye-opening for me, making me think I might even be a kind of a crummy cat daddy after all, but we'll come back to that later. So, <laughs> But first, let's trace your path a little bit that led to your status as a cat expert with a doctorate. I gather it's a narrative that includes dropping out of school and playing bass in punk bands. That's just too interesting to skip over, if you ask me. Sure. So, yeah, tell, so, so tell, tell me uh, some, some of that story. Regale me with some, some great to- story, tales of rock and roll, etc. Yeah, so I was definitely a cat lover my whole life, but I wasn't, you know, a lot of times people assume, like, oh, you must have wanted to be a veterinarian. No, I had no major aspirations, and I was... Mostly, you know, a teenager who really loved punk music, and I wanted to move to California, and uh, so I dropped out of college. I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20, so I did move to California. I played in a bunch of punk bands. I got to, you know, drive around the country in a dirty van and, you know, sleep on people's floors in a sleeping bag and play shows in, you know, empty bars and... It's, uh, it sounds so romantic so far. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was fun. It was a good experience, but, you know, I, now I prefer working with cats. Um, and well, are there some punk bands uh, along the way that oh. we might recognize? Um, well, none that I was in because, you know, none of... If, if my bands had become really successful, maybe my life would be very different. But, you know, I was lucky to play with a lot of um, great artists like Sleater Kinney and Mission of Burma and... Um, Oh, gosh. Um, You know, Miranda July and, um, you know, lots of, um, you know, a lot of female-based artists. Yeah. uh, But really um, just a lot of um, great opportunities to experience the world and play music, which I still, you know, really love music. So that was a big part of my life. Yeah. Um, Although, you know, cats were still always, you know, I always had cats. I moved my cats out to California with me. So they were, you know, definitely part of my life. So you had cats cats. when you were a touring uh, musician? Yes. In that way? Yes. Wow. That must have been no small task. Well, I had roommates. You know, I lived in San Francisco. You have roommates. um, And they were nice enough to feed the cats while I was out of town. So, um yeah, you, you make do, and certainly, you know, when I was younger, I had, you know, maybe I was less, um, less. Of a, I mean, I was, a, I, I will say, I was a responsible cat 
guardian. I always took my cats to the vet and they got great care and food and lots of attention and everything. So, but I think now I'm just a little more like, you know, obsessive about my cats. Yeah. But (laughs) um, when one of my cats died, that was actually what kind of led me to cat behavior because um, I had two cats and one of them passed away and I, he was, you know, like my best buddy and I really missed him. And a friend of mine had started volunteering at the local animal shelter. And he was like, you know, I think it would do you some good to volunteer at the shelter. And I think he just wanted a friend to volunteer with him. But I, you know, I I signed up and started volunteering at the San Francisco SPCA, which is, and certainly at the time, so this was in 2000, was one of the best animal shelters in the world. Yeah. Very very established programs. The cats did not, and dogs didn't live in cages. They had rooms that were like human house rooms. And they actually had a whole program for cats who were having challenges adjusting to the shelter lifestyle. So these were cats who were very fearful and stressed out, or maybe they had a history of behavior problems. And I immediately was like, how do I work with those cats? I was like, you know, I wanted to work with cats that were not accessible to me. So I had to go through extra training to work with cats that had special needs and behavior issues. And that was kind of it. That opened the floodgates. I became obsessed with helping cats who were having challenges in whatever environment they were in, whether it was a shelter or a vet clinic or in the home. And I basically volunteered there so much that when a job opened up, they gave it to me. <laughs> so well, that, 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 that's, that, that only seems fair and fitting. But let me ask you this, Dr. Delgado. So obviously you're a cat person, you know, from the get-go, basically, it sounds like it. But why do you think when you got to the shelter and, and you know, sort of responded to that, that friend who said, hey, you should volunteer over here. And again, that uh, San Francisco SPCA is certainly, I think, highly regarded and has been for, for years and years and years. Um, but why do you think you were particularly drawn to the cats that were having those kind of struggles? Yeah, it's a great question. I did have a shy cat, and so I've always had kind of a soft spot for scaredy cats. Mm-hmm. But it was really like something in me clicked that these cats needed me. It was like they needed help. And okay. And they, you know, so that really called out to me that this was an opportunity to make a difference. This wasn't just like going in and playing with kittens and watching them go off to their new homes. This was about rehabilitation. This was about helping people understand the cats they were adopting. So, you know, if someone was interested in adopting a cat with behavior issues, we did a a fair amount of counseling with them on how to prepare their home and how to work with the cat's specific behavior needs. And that was really where this whole, like, um, even conceptually that you could do this as a job, help people understand their cats. Yeah. Wow. This is like unbelievable. (laughs) That's calling to you loud and clear. It sounds like, yeah. Yeah. And I distinctly remember the day I came home from the shelter, I sat down for dinner with my boyfriend and I said, I think I want to become a cat behaviorist. And he was like, that sounds cool. (laughs) You know, he was like very like supportive. and, And that was, really it. I, you know, switched my jobs and then started learning as much as I could about cats. I read every, you know, veterinary behavior textbook I could get my hands on. I um, really just tried to immerse myself in understanding cats in ways I never had, even though I'd lived with cats a lot of my life. So it sounds like really like there was kind of an early sort of passion for cats like many of us might have had a passion for cats and then the shelter thing like flipped on a switch so it was like here's a whole other level of passion i still have the other passion down below here but up here i've got this other passion about helping them and then i want to absorb every detail i can about cats yes and that eventually turned into i need to go back to school and study animal behavior like i want to understand this on maybe a more like academic or intellectual level that i was not at at the time I had the kind of, you know, hands on or feet on the ground understanding and like hands on experience. But then I was like, I also want to do research and understand, you know, why animals do the things they do, you know, recognizing too that humans are animals, right? So sure. there's there's a lot of parallels. So so that was kind of when I decided to leave the shelter, go back to school, you know, that took almost ten years to because I had to finish my bachelor's degree because I dropped out of college and right. then get a PhD, which I took my time. You know, I, I, I was, you know, maybe a little longer than average in completing my PhD, but I had a lot of fun during my PhD, so I wasn't in a hurry to leave. Sure. And um, so that was really kind of balancing out that shelter experience and knowledge that I'd gained working there and experience I had 
you know, with cat owners and adding kind of the separate research and maybe more dry academic piece to that knowledge. So let me just back up for just a brief sec. So when you decided to go back to school, uh, what did that decision look like? Like I'm enrolling, I'm going to get back on track for my undergrad and we'll see where this leads. Or even then were you thinking, hey, I'm all in, I'm going to pursue a PhD however long it takes me? No, I actually didn't really, you know, neither of my parents had gone to college when I was growing up, so I didn't really know much about how you get a PhD. And so when I was an undergrad, you know, I was in my late 30s, so I was a re-entry student. That's yeah. not like the typical student in, in my cohort, but um, I became part of a program called the McNair Scholars Program, which was aimed at preparing underrepresented students for the PhD lifestyle. And so uh. that was really um, helped me, you know, and, and as, as an undergrad, I did work in a pigeon laboratory. So I was doing animal behavior research and understood like, oh, this is kind of fun and cool, but I didn't really understand like, oh, what a PhD is or what it, you know, how you get one. And so really at that point, I was like, oh, this is cool. I want to do this. And, you know, applying for a PhD is not an easy process. It's really about finding, like, a good match and not necessarily, like, I just want to go to this school. So, you know, it's something that if people really want to do it, it's a great experience, but it's also very um, challenging. I probably cried more during my Ph.D. than I have the rest of my life. And, you know, it was um, it was challenging, but it was also very rewarding. That's that's what I can say about it. So. Yeah. Well, and again... Um UC Berkeley, that's uh, obviously a you know very uh, prominent school for any kind of level of education. So I'm sure getting a PhD there was full of challenges, but also full of great rewards, including when you were holding up your you know your PhD from UC Berkeley. Yeah, it's not too shabby. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> so, so let me ask you now then. So having done all that from either a non-scientific standpoint or or scientific kind of research minded given everything you've done what 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 are the most appealing things you find about cats now did you kind of merge the earlier passion uh, along with the sort of academic research version of the passion or i'd be curious to know like you know how that might have shifted or if there's just sort of a big rich love of cats that's complicated to answer no, it's, I mean, you know, I do love cats. I see a cat. I want to, like, take pictures of them. I want. I would love to cuddle them, but they don't always want to cuddle me, so I, I don't pick them up and cuddle them. But, you know, I, I do have that. You know, I like to watch cute videos of cats on the Internet, so I, you know, I have that fascination. But as far as, like, from a more, like, you know, behavior um, perspective or understanding, like, the science, you know, part of it is that research with um, companion animals is a pretty – you know, nascent field is very young still, and it's, it is fairly challenging to do research with animals if you don't want to, for example, keep them in a laboratory or do anything to them that would cause them harm, right? And so that was always kind of my personal ethos in working with animals is that I wanted to either work with pets who were living in homes or I wanted to work with, like, free-ranging wild animals. That was um, really important to me to not be doing um you know, continuing like laboratory work or doing anything where the animals were, um, you know, had surgery on them and, and not to judge people who do that kind of research. It just wasn't for me. So, right. Just personally, um, it just yeah. you didn't like the intrusiveness and other impact of that other kind of research. But you're just saying, hey, that, good for you if that's what you're doing. I just want to do this kind of over here. Yeah, and so, but, you know, but the hard part is, like, recruiting, you know, you'd think that everybody and their grandmother would want to enroll their cat in a study, but that's, it's actually not the case, so, you know, it can be challenging to get subjects, and so, you know, if you look at, like, you know, research with people's cats, you can't really ask people to bring their cat to a laboratory and expect that 90% of those cats are going to be able to cope with being in a strange environment and do normal cat things, so we often have to study them in an environment that's you know, they're accustomed to, like their homes. So there are kind of challenges with cats that maybe you don't have with dogs because dogs are used to going to the grocery store with you or to the park. They leave their home, whereas most cats do not. So it, there are just some, some other challenges that I think make it harder to study cats. And, of course, getting funding to do this, you know, any type of research is a struggle. 
So that said, you know, I think the, the field of, of companion animal behavior is still growing and expanding in interesting ways. And what fascinates me about cats to this day is kind of the way they bridge this gap between a wild animal and a domestic animal. Like there's still a lot of things about them that are just like their, you know, nearest ancestors, the African wild cat. And there's a lot of things that we haven't really asked them to change as part of the domestication process. So the behaviors we see in our cats that sometimes cause conflict with the owner are very much instinctive to them. So, you know, using scratching posts and being up high and climbing on things and, um, you know, needing to play or hunt, um, you know, needing a clean place to go to the bathroom. These are things that are very important to cats. They're part of their nature. And we haven't really asked them to change their behavior in order to be pets for us. We've just kind of accepted that they get the zoomies and then get a little bit wild and that's, a cat. <laughs> so yeah. To me, that's that's one of the most interesting things about cats is this kind of in betweenness of them. They're not. They're obviously domesticated. They sleep on our beds and they cuddle with us and do all kinds of cute things. But they still have this wild side that I really appreciate. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, just in case some some folks may have just tuned in. I want to um, just uh, kind of quickly reintroduce you here. And then we'll see, we might have a call as well. But this is Talking Animals on WNF. I'm Duncan Strauss. If you did just tune in, my guest is Dr. Michael Delgado, a surf, certified cat behavior consultant, animal behavior scientist, and author most recently of Play With Your Cat, the essential guide to interactive play for a happier, healthier feeling. If you have cat questions for Dr. Delgado or would like to offer a comment, uh, feline-related, uh, ideally, please call 813-239-9663. Uh, email dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. I think we'll take one, try to take one of those calls right now. Hi, you're on Talking Animal with Dr. Degato. Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm trying to get the uh, the name of the book again. Okay, great. We can give that to you. It's Play With Your Cat with a big emphatic exclamation mark. And then the subtitle is The Essential Guide to Interactive Play for a Happier, Healthier Feline. I got it, and I'm going to order it. Thank you. Okay, well, that's 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 great. And again, I think uh, you'll really enjoy it. And if you're a longtime cat person, I think you'll find some some surprising elements so much what we're going to discuss with Dr. Uh, Delgado presently. So, I've had, thanks I've for had cats since Christ was a corporal. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. Thanks for your call. So... So one thing that we just t- you just touched on, and you kind of probably sort of already answered it, because I was going to ask about... The fact that it appears studying cats, scientific research of, you know, domestic felines, the, you know, those kind of cats, is far less common than studying dogs. And, um, I mean, I think you kind of touched on it, but any other thoughts about why that's, why the gap, at least to a lay person, seems huge? Yeah, and I think part of that is because we have selected dogs to do things for humans, right? So a lot of research with dogs is about using them as assistance animals, um, their ability to use their noses to do work for us, whether it's detecting if someone has a disease or finding a body or drugs, right? So we have this, um, although, you know, dogs are known as human's best friend, um, and we certainly love dogs a lot, they do have kind of a more utilitarian relationship with humans compared to cats. Cats are kind of freeloaders in some ways. So <laughs> I think that part of it is just we have a longer history with dogs and we do many more things with them. So they're like that ra- uh, that roommate that's always slow on the uh, the month's rent. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So I think we're going to take another call, uh, maybe momentarily. But um, did you say when you were talking about the, the distinction about like trying to persuade people to uh, participate in re- cat research? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe this you're just uh, my my inference here. But did that mean that sometimes the research that you needed to conduct almost meant like sort of making a house call to where they were, rather, since since they maybe weren't going to bring a cat or a cat that was clearly going to be uncomfortable yeah. in a laboratory so, or, or you know scientific yeah. setting. Yeah, and more researchers are turning to methodologies where we can, for example, um, give people a a camera to set up in their home so we can observe their cat's behavior in the home. Um, People are maybe doing some of the um, tests. A lot of these are like cognitive or behavioral tests where we're asking cats to make a choice or engage with an object. And so, yeah, a lot of researchers will bring themselves and their equipment into someone's home and work with the cats there. Cool. Makes, Makes good sense. All right, let's take another call. 
Hi, you're on Talk Hands with Dr. Delgado. Hi, thank you, fellow panel alum here with uh, that question that um, I've been searching for a toy for the cat that it can entertain itself because she loves to play, but she wants to play all the time. Um, <laughs> she will come into my room, I mean, the office or room, and just squawk and look at me and squawk until I, you know, I give in. And she knows I've hidden the toy somewhere. <laughs> Once I get it, I have to keep playing, or you know, she'll just play forever, and I, I feel bad when I have to put it away and carry on with my human life. But sometimes I do, and she doesn't understand that. So, can you recommend any? I've tried a few things, but if you can recommend anything that cats can use on their own, or she might, she might invent itself. Great question. So. You know, I always look at it at a, as a holistic thing. Well, one, first of all, it sounds like your cat has you very well trained, right? She understands that meowing in your office or wherever you are will get eventually get you to break down and play with her. So, um, so she has trained you. Um, but yeah, this is. Um, I always look at it from both. Like, are there other things we can do with the cat besides play? Which you know sounds funny since I'm promoting a book about play, but I'm thinking of things like enrichment that she can kind of. Um, engage in on her own. So just like when we start our work day, we kind of look at our calendar and it's often full of meetings and appointments. Um, however, your cat is looking at her Google calendar and it probably just says bug dad to play with me. <laughs> so we want to do things like give her food puzzles. We want to give her um, enrichment that engages her senses like um, catnip or cat grass and toys to play with on her own. So you asked about toys to play with on her own. And of course there are the, you know, the ping pong balls and fuzzy mice and that sort of thing. And those toys don't move. And so for a lot of adult cats, they're not as attractive after maybe a few minutes or if you're not throwing them. Now, the thing with um, the self-play toys that are robotic, and I do talk about this in the book, is that they vary greatly in quality. Um, cats, some cats really enjoy them and other cats don't. So you want to experiment a little bit. Um, I do like there's a toy called the Smarty Cat, which is like a fabric like a fabric circle that has a little feather that moves underneath it and a lot of cats are really attracted to movement under fabric or under tissue paper or whatever that one i've found personally i've had more success with than some of the like other robotic toys that roll around because to have a motor the toy has to be quite large larger than cats natural prey um, i also really like the hex bug nano which is a very small bug like toy that does move around so that would be an option if you do want something that she can follow around on her own. I will also say really quickly is just when you do play with her, make sure you wind down the play in a way that lets her cool down. And so that can help her calm down behaviorally and then give her a treat or a snack to kind of encourage that natural cycle of behavior where they would, you know, kind of stalk, hunt, eat, and then groom and take a nap. So those would be some tips. Um, increase her general enrichment and then change how you play, and then, yeah, supplement it with some food puzzles, some solo play toys, and try a few robotic toys. I wish I had one that was fail-safe, worked with every other cat, but some of my cats have liked robotic toys and others have not, and, you know, sometimes they like the floppy fish and sometimes they don't. So, um, so yeah, you might um, want to find some other friends with cats and try trading some toys and see what your cats like. She liked the robotic ball that rolled around on its own for about a day, and then she was like, "Yeah, it's a robot. I need you to do it." Yeah, you like, know, you yeah. know what she said at that point. You know what's missing? The, my owner, the guy, the guy I hang out with, right? Yes. That that was yeah. her chief complaint then, and probably ever ever since. Okay, thank yeah. you very and much. The other thing, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, no, thanks for calling. Thanks for calling, and. Um, you know, I didn't mean to be flip about that because that probably just brings us to, uh, you know, as I kind of alluded to at the beginning of the show. I, I but I doubt I'm uh, going to be hardly alone as a longtime cat person who finds it jarring to learn to what extent I'm essentially depriving our cats <laughs> of important activity and stimulation. Um, so before we get into more about that and kind of some of what the things are that you advocate more specifically in that regard, what kind of early reaction has, has the, the new book elicited in that regard? Yeah, I will say my intention was to like inspire people to get enthusiastic about play with their cat, and I don't want to shame anybody. And the nice thing about play is that 
even three to five minutes a day can make a big difference for a lot of cats. So the goal is to encourage behavior change. I'd say people have been very positive about the book. I really tried to write it in a way that it was accessible and fun to read. Oh, yeah. Lovely illustrations by Lily Chin, who's a fantastic animal artist. Um, so I really wanted, and, I, and, you know, I include some exercises that people can do with their cats. So it's not meant to be a chastising, like, you know, how dare you? But I yeah. just wanted people to, to understand the why, like why you should do this and hopefully to have fun doing it. Right. And and I know probably more than ever, people feel very stretched for time. We have a lot of distractions in our environment and it's very hard for us to even take a few minutes for our own self to not like scroll through, you know, page after page of bad news or, um, you know, just feel like we're constantly working. And so I get that it's, um, you know, the call to action to play with your cat is for some people might feel a little overwhelming, but I really want people to understand how much benefit it can provide to your cat and your relationship with your cat. And hopefully you can have some fun doing it. Like I love watching my cat play with toys and like when I can get them to do the butt wiggle and pounce, it's like I always laugh. So I really want to bring some joy to people's lives. Yeah, and and again, you know, uh, I didn't at all want to suggest or mean to suggest that it was chastising at all because it's very, it's breezy, it's conversational, it's fun, it's packed with information. Um, I just felt like I wanted to chastise myself once I read more <laughs> of the things that, you know, you as an expert are saying and things that I thought, well, not necessarily that I knew, but I guess I was just caught off guard by some of the things about the play that I was you know, clearly falling short on, and, and I'm going to try to step up here in the, in the next, uh, as soon as possible. So, uh, and again, I just think a lot of long-time cat people probably will have similar responses. So, we've had one caller holding for quite some time. Let's get them involved, and then I want to talk more about a specific uh, uh, approaches to, to cat play. Hi, you're on Talking Animals with Dr. Delgado. Hi, good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that, Dr. Delgado, how lucky you are or how fortunate you are to have a job that you're passionate about and you love. Uh, so many of us just work to pay bills, so God bless you for that. I think that's fantastic. Here, here, for sure. Yeah, you can tell you're passionate about it. But um, my question was this. Uh, my family's always had cats. It's, I'm average from speaking. I'm 63 years old. When we were kids, our cats lived to be anywhere between 8 and 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Back in 1990, I bought some property. I had a nice barn outside of the house, and uh, I still love cats. My wife was allergic to them, so I had I had a total of six cats in the barn. Mm-hmm. And all of those cats, they all got attention. They always had the same frisky food and fresh water. They all lived between 17 and 24 years old. Wow. And I, I just, I'm wondering if it's the toxins inside the houses that kill cats early because I never heard of a cat living that long, and they, they just the only the only medical care those cats ever got was uh, they were spaded or neutered, and then I gave them ivermectin every once in a while to deworm them. That was it. They never went to the vets. They never got shots. You know, we had that and another sixty uh, goats and sheep and whatnot. So they were on their own in that department. But they lived forever. Yeah, those are impressive ages. You know, I'm not a veterinarian, so I I definitely can't speak to like why those particular cats benefited from the lifestyle you provided for them. They might have had good genes, right? So we know that there's lots of things that contribute to longevity. Um, it could be that they were very happy, and we know that stress oh. leads to disease. Yeah. They, they got all the attention they wanted when they wanted it, but they had their outside, outside time. And sure. um, I don't I don't know if I would do that now with the coyotes as bad as they are because they, they like to eat cats yep. for dinner, so I don't know if I would be comfortable doing that anymore. But, uh, yeah, yeah and crazy. It, you know... Yeah, well, I your think experience it's does what you're doing, and and my mother is 84 years old, and that cat is better than a dog for her. It's like oh, the best that's friend. great. That's great. Yes, God and I will you. say that you know one thing is that we are increasingly keeping our cats indoors, and that was part of the reason that I wanted to write this book because um, you know I do advocate keeping cats indoors generally. I know it's not the right lifestyle for every cat and every person, so um, I'm, I'm not judgmental, but just, you know, the reality is is that cats who do have outside access are, you know, prey to coyotes. They are also, you know, killing other animals, and these are things that we should be cognizant of. 
And we're all making judgments about, like, you know, the risks and benefits of keeping our cats indoors or outdoors. But that said, because many of us, especially in the United States, do keep our cats indoors, they are not getting those hunting experiences and um, outdoor experiences that th- those barn kitties had. And so we can replicate that by playing with our cats with interactive toys, meaning toys that we move like prey and enact those hunting behaviors in our cats. You know, I, I, I never thought about it. You just said that I had um, three males and three females. And the females, they didn't really, they didn't care if they hunted that much, whereas the males were always out mm. hunting, you know, mm-hmm. mice and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But, that's, you know, I never thought about that. But, yeah, you're right. They did like to hunt. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your call. And that's uh, super impressive about those, the longevity of those barn cats. Thanks again for your call. So uh, we're going to carry on here, Dr. Delgado. But uh, I'm, I'm tempted to, in the light of our last call to, to move into a barn myself. I mean, those are incredible <laughs> statistics. Maybe we'll live much longer, right? I, I should only assume, yeah. All right, so let's get to it in a more uh, specific way, like maybe like an elevator pitch. Can you just explain, at least initially, kind of an overview sense, I guess, why we should play with our cats in the way that you, uh, you know, outline and then, you know, kind of underscore throughout the book? Um, it's because it's not just it's not just play, and it's not just like like the earlier caller who said, "Hey, I can't always play with a cat. What what can I do?" I mean, you can't just like put something out for them or put a food puzzle out. I mean, that's a supplemental thing from your standpoint. But the key thing is interactive play, which is no surprise that that's part of the title or subtitle. Yes, and so by interactive play, I mean that there's a cat, there's a toy, and there's a human moving the toy. So that's how I would define interactive play. The reason that play is so important is kind of tying back to the concept of welfare in animals that live with humans or under human control. And that is um, one of those key tenets is giving them the ability to express natural instinctive behaviors. And for cats, hunting is one of those behaviors. We also know that hunting behavior and play behavior are essentially the same thing. The same behaviors, we see the same behavior patterns when cats play as when they hunt. And we see a lot of the same motivators. So cats are more likely to hunt when they're hungry. They're also more likely to play when they're hungry. So from these things, we can basically say play is hunting for our cats. And cats need outlets for this natural behavior. We can give them that outlet by playing with those wand toys, by moving a feather wand like a bird, by moving that, you know, stick toy with a mouse on the end like a mouse would really move and allow our cats to express that natural behavior that probably also feels good to them. You know, behaviors that are instinctive that we need to survive tend to feel good. And so there's a lot of reason to think that cats would be motivated to play. So there's that piece of it. And then there's the other pieces where we see the benefits from play and activity in all species. And that's the other thing I would just address is that we see play in every animal species that's been studied in. So play has an evolutionary function for all of us that is, you know, a part of our behavioral repertoire, probably for good reasons. Probably it feels good. Probably it helps us prepare for real world situations. And so that's why we see it in every animal from bees to cows to humans. So that's my pitch for like why play is important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think also, like I've alluded to before, it's a great way to bond with your cat and have fun with them. Um, certainly not if you're like having to get up out of your chair every two minutes because your cat is screaming their head off, but that's that's a topic for a behavior consultation. <laughs> for sure. Well, one thing, too, is, uh, uh, you know, early on you note that, as with humans, play can also uh, sharpen animals' cognitive ability, um, which, you know, is obviously super important. And uh, although I did wonder if, if I start playing with my cats in the way you recommend, will they do better at Wordle than I do? <laughs> it's possible. I don't know if they'll be able to help you with Wordle. But, yeah. Um, yeah, but, you know, cats are pretty smart. <laughs> yeah, but back to the hunting thing, because I think for a lot of people, again, a lot of cat people, long-term cat people are just, you know, kind of uh, avowed cat people. I think, and I could be wrong about this to the extent that I think it exists, I think some people love cats but don't love the hunting part. Mm-hmm. And so then the idea that these are so really kind of integrally linked um, might be hard for people to, they got to have to rethink some things or maybe even reprogram themselves to, to see the value for the play is really hooked to that tendency to hunt that they 
yesterday at least didn't think was so great. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest challenges for cats is that people tend to either think of them as small humans or as dogs, right? They want them to be like dogs or they want them to be like us. And I am definitely an advocate for accepting cats for who they are and for allowing them to be cats. And if you've ever had a fly come into your house or a moth, I think everybody knows that their cat's hunting instinct is still pretty intact. (laughs) I know, like, you know, and I play with my cats every day, but I can also tell you that when a fly comes in the house, man, all three of my cats are, like, laser-focused on that fly. It's like something has just switched in them. This is is a whole new deal here. Yeah. Yes. So... So, you know, and, and it's true, we don't often see that instinct in our cats or we, we tend to appreciate the, like, the cuddly, sweet side and we don't like it when they bring dead animals home or kill a grasshopper inside our house and now we've got to clean up the mess. Um, but it is really, um, you know, it's what they've evolved to do. They do it very well. And as I mentioned before, we haven't asked them to not do it. We haven't changed their behavior through domestication in a way that says, mm, maybe you should hunt less. Yeah. Well, and also in the book, you're fairly uh, insistent, adamant, whatever the right word is, about various recommendations and entreaties, like starting with play with your cat, like like sort of no excuses, um, uh, but also how you play with your cat. Like uh, it's clear that you don't mean, hey, sitting on the couch and then dragging a piece of yarn while you're watching your favorite uh, Netflix show right now. Or, or even using a full-fledged cat toy while scrolling on your phone. Like, you really, a big part of it, if I follow this, is that the toys are important, the cat is important, your participation is super important. And, like, engage, you really want people to engage during the time you're doing it, even if it's brief. Okay, put the phone down, turn off the Netflix, whatever, and super engage with, with that cat. Yes, and what I will say is if, if you absolutely cannot put your phone down or cannot turn off the Netflix, I'd rather have you play with your cat and multitask than not play with them at all. But it is really about like, you know, this idea that we all struggle with to kind of focus on the relationship in front of us and not let the pull of technology like turn us away from this, you know, like I said, just a few minutes a day of really enjoying what our cat's doing. But because I also want people to be behaviorists. I want them to observe what what kind of toy movements their cats like, what gets them to stalk, what gets them to butt wiggle, what gets them to do that final pounce. And if you're not paying attention, you might either not realize that your cat is enjoying what you're doing very much or that they're actually not enjoying it very much. So so there is this kind of skill building that I would like people to like really be observers and scientists in their approach. Because th- as a result of that, then that would help shape your your subsequent play sessions, so like what you did or what you didn't do or what toy seemed to really uh, have a particular impact versus another yeah. toy or two. I mean, these are all yeah, things that you, by, too, by, by right? paying close attention, you would know those things and you would make the play sessions even more effective for the cat. Exactly. And that's why I gave people a lot of recommendations about how to move toys specifically. Like, you know, I really tried to give people like, here's, you know, 10 different ways to move a toy. Try them and see which ones your cat likes. Yeah. All right. Well, let me reintroduce you again. And then I want to talk a little bit more about toys since we're kind of wandered on that topic. Not surprising. This is Talking Animals on WNF. I'm Duncan Strauss. My guest is Dr. Michael Delgado, a certified cat behavior consultant. Her new book is Play With Your Cat, The Essential Guide to Interactive Play for a Happier, Healthier Feline. We invite you to join the conversation with any thoughts about cats or cat toys or playing with cats. Calling 813-239-9663. Or you can email dj at wnf.org or text 813-433-0885. So you offer considerable discussion of toys, not surprisingly, since uh, given what we've already, I think, touched on here in our conversation. So which toys seem best and why, and um, including which ones are most likely to trigger kind of that, that hunting drive that, that it is so connected to, to I think, I guess, most effective play. Um, so the coverage is pretty extensive, but might you summarize the, the principal, uh, you know, kind of recommendations and or, as you just alluded to, how, how you actually most effectively move and present those toys in, in a play session? Yeah. So the key to this is remembering, again, that the cats are hunters. So we want to use toys that resemble prey in some way, and we also want to move those toys in ways that prey would move. So... 
if we think about some of the research with cats and hunting and also with play, we know that they respond better to smaller toys than larger toys. Like they can be a little intimidated by large prey. So as an example, like cats are not really that great at hunting rats compared to mice. They much prefer mice. Mice are much less formidable opponent. They're much less, less likely to get injured hunting a rat. So when we're moving toys or we're choosing toys, we want to pick things that might be small, resemble a bird, resemble a mouse, resemble a bug, resemble a lizard. Those are kind of my major prey categories that I talk about in the book. And so I don't talk a lot about specific brands of toys and I don't have any affiliations with toy companies. I yeah. test out different products and, you know, see what cats tend to like and what my clients say their cats like. Um, so, so yeah, thinking about like feathers that, um, things that have fur, things that have a, you know, a papery like insect wing feel. So thinking about the texture, the size, the colors, maybe not as important, but we're really like thinking about, um, how does this toy move? How does it feel when the cat touches it or bites it? And does it resemble prey? And then when you're moving it, thinking about, like, how do birds move? Right? And I talk about this in, in the book. Like, you know, they fly around and then they land and then they hop and then they peck and then they fly somewhere else. And so we can mimic some of those movements when you're playing. Like, what does a mouse do? Mice like to scurry around on the floor and hide behind things. So we can move the toy like a mouse. And it is, you know, and I encourage people to watch videos online that, you know, are made for cats if they don't know how birds and mice move or maybe it's been a while. But so simulating some of those movements is going to be much more effective than just whipping the toy around. And I think sometimes people kind of think like, oh, I just wave it around and then the cat's going to um, magically jump around for it. And so we want to be a little more strategic and thoughtful when we're playing. Okay, well, that sounds really cool. Uh, you know, one of our emailers says, great show today. I'm going to go home and play with my cats tonight. Anyway, is catnip okay? And I, I would quickly answer and then you'll give the actual answer boy is it yes i'm a big fan of you know olfactory enrichment is what i would call that so anything related to the cat's sense of smell and um, catnip is okay but we have to recognize that one about 60 percent of cats respond to it so you might have a non-responder and there are other types of plants that cats also respond to, like silver vine and tetarian honeysuckle and valerian. So if your cat doesn't respond to catnip, maybe try one of these other enrichments for cats that involve their sense of smell. And then the last piece I'll just say is you have to know how your cat responds to it, because some cats are kind of what, what we call happy drunks and some are mean drunks. <laughs> and so, um, so you just want to make sure if your cat is the kind of cat who gets really worked up on catnip that you don't try to pet them or maybe you separate them from your other pets in the home um, when they're using catnip. Um, we, we know that, you know, the response to catnip is a pleasurable one. And, um, yeah, for most cats, it's completely safe to indulge. There's no fear of addiction or physical harm. So catnip away. Okay, well, that sounds good. So on Saturday, we're sort of nearing the end of our time, Dr. Delgado, but the, uh, I just want to emphasize... This book is brimming with information and suggestions, uh, all under the umbrella of play with your cat, of course, but ranging from how to approach play with cats who have such disabilities as blindness, deafness, mobility challenges, et cetera, to how to integrate a new cat into an existing household. In fact, a prominent member of the community of of big cats, he might not care if he's identified, but I don't have his permission, so I'm just going to say that much about him right now. But seeing that you'd be as... um, Today's guest sent me this note the other day saying, Duncan, I hope to tune into your show Wednesday, but if not, we'll play it later. If you have a chance, I think I'm not the only one who would love any advice on dealing with cats who do not get along when you introduce a new one to the household. We took in a very young feral cat who remarkably has adapted to becoming an affection-seeking indoor cat, which I'm told is very unusual. When she first saw one of our other two cats, a six-year-old, she went up to her seeking to be friends and got rudely rebuffed. Now they have pretty much divided the house in half. And if they do come into sight of each other, start wailing at each other. It would be great to know if your guest has any suggestions. Nothing I found online was helpful. Yes, this is the most common reason that people hire me for my cat behavior consulting services is uh, difficulties introducing a new cat into the home. It's a very common situation. And what I will just say briefly is, you know, we are picking our cat's roommates for them. And, you know, certainly sometimes things happen. You you rescue a kitty and um, you don't necessarily or aren't thinking about matchmaking and that sort of thing. Um, so what I would say is if you are struggling is find a qualified behavior consultant to work with because this process can take months 
and um, you know it also doesn't always work, right? So not all cats want to live with other cats or with the specific cat that has entered the home. However, we can see a lot of success when we go very slowly, when we give the cats reasons to like each other, and when we give them specific behaviors to do around each other. So I'm not an advocate of just feeding cats near each other in the hopes that they'll decide like, oh, since I eat near this cat, they'll will suddenly like each other because cats are not group eaters. They don't eat socially. Um, they hunt very small prey that they don't share. And so it's a common recommendation to just, oh, feed them together or feed them on either side of a baby gate and they'll, you know, eventually accept each other. That is true for some cats, but those cats may have ended up getting along anyway. So, you know, I tend to do more specific things like clicker training where I'm in, I'm basically training cats to do certain behaviors in the presence of the other cat. It's definitely more than I can get into on a call, which is why I would say, like, if you can afford to work with somebody, um, that can walk you through the steps, but basically it is we manage the situation by separating the cats and kind of introducing them in a slow and controlled manner, incorporating exercises, including play. Like play is a great way to get cats to show relaxed body language in front of each other, but I do like to use like a screen door or a baby gate between them at first to make sure we're not allowing any negative interactions, like no fighting, no physical fighting, because once those fights occur, it can be pretty hard to convince cats to accept each other. Um, so that's, yeah, it's like very hard to give very specific advice because every situation is different. Like it can depend on the setup of your house and how you have it split up and how much time do you have? Do you have another person in the home that can help navigate these introduction processes? And unfortunately, there's just not a lot of research on cat introductions and cat relationships. So there's a lot we don't know and we just try to operate based on um, our best knowledge of cat behavior and also our experience with other clients or our own cats. But basically, in a nutshell, go very slow, do a lot of heavy management, and um, incorporate, like I said, training cats about what behaviors you do want them to do around each other. So we're giving them very specific things. We could probably have a whole separate conversation about training cats yeah. because a lot of people don't even know that's possible. But I use it a lot with my clients to um, basically tell their cats what I want them to do around each other. And that means doing things like sitting, focusing on their human um, moving away from the other cats and that sort of thing. Um, and the last thing I'll say is when you have multiple cats in your home, you do want to make sure that the environment has enough resources for them. So that means lots of litter boxes, separate feeding areas, um, separate, you know, climbing and scratching spaces so that the cats can choose to avoid each other instead of having conflict over access to those important things. All right. Well, fair enough, Dr. Degato. Let's. Uh, this is a good time, I think, to mention also that your website is Michael M I K E L Delgado D E L G A D O dot com. Michael Delgado dot com. So you can find out all kinds of information. And again, if you do want to uh, book a consultation or just find out some more stuff about some of the things we touched on here today in our conversation on talking animals, that's probably the best way to go about that. And again, just want yeah. to remind you that her new book, which again is as you probably gathered, is chock full of great information and all kinds of tips and guidance and uh, entreaties and all kinds of things more, uh, is Play With Your Cat with a big, again, emphatic exclamation mark, The Essential Guide to Interactive Play for a Happier, Healthier Feline. You can get that pretty much wherever you get your books, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, Dr. Delgado? That is correct. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Talking Animals, and uh, I learned a lot, and I think hopefully people listening did, and anybody who picks up the book, I can almost guarantee they will learn a lot, no matter what their level of cat uh, catdom is. Thank you so much. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you. Coming up in just a moment, I'm going to probably skip over the animal news segment that we've promise because we spent more time with Dr. Delgado, which was great. I was hoping that might go that way. So we'll come back to the animal news maybe next week. But uh, right now we're going to step into the comedy corner with a piece from one of our faves here at Talking Animals, Joe Zimmerman. This is a piece called Crows from Joe Zimmerman in today's comedy corner on Talking Animals. On Talking Animals. I'm mad at Google right now. I had an important question to ask, and I remember typing in, what is my... Before I could finish, the thing that Google suggested was spirit animal. (laughs) And I was like, yeah, what is it? (laughs) Because you see other people, and you know, right? You're like, toucan. But nobody's ever told me mine, so I'm genuinely taking this online spirit animal quiz. (laughs) 
hoping I'm a chocolate lab. I don't know if I've ever been more disappointed than to learn I'm a crow. I thought these were supposed to be fun. Congrats, you're the scavenger bird. You're defensive. You're defensive. The crow likes laughing and eating. Everybody likes laughing and eating. It's almost like these internet quizzes are just making stuff up. I was aggravated, like a crow would be. So I went back to Google, looked up second opinion online spirit animal quiz. Like, no way I'm a crow twice. This time I'm basically lying, trying to get chocolate lab. Like, love snuggling and being rescued. Come on. Quiz number two told me I'm a cricket. That's not even an animal, that's an insect. I don't want a spirit bug. So now crow's starting to sound pretty good. Now I'm researching more about crows to learn a little bit more about my people. <laughs> Typing into Google, are crows cool? And uh, short version, they are. They are cool. I recommend them. Crows recognize individual human faces. I know you guys are like, this guy's not going to keep talking about crows, is he? <laughs> but I kind of need to. I'll sum up the study real quick. Basically, a scientist was mean to a crow and then released it, waited to see if the crow remembered him. Not only did it remember him, but it was like, I hate you. And then it surprised him when it told other crows and it could point him out in a crowd. It was like, that dude's cool, that dude's cool, that's the dude. And then those crows spread the word to even more crows. They were like, that's the man who bullied Jonathan. That doesn't sound, that doesn't sound that crazy because we also recognize other human faces. That'd be the equivalent of us recognizing an individual crow's face. Like, there he is. That's the one who stole my windowsill pie. So don't mess with crows because they're smart, they hold grudges, and groups of crows are called murders. You know what groups of people are called? Groups. I'll tell you who else holds a grudge, Crow Zimmerman. That is Joe Zimmerman in today's Comedy Corner with a piece called Crows, taken from an appearance on Conan. Coming up on WNF, it's The Conversation, the new show with Mario Nunez and Joe King Carter. After that, we shift back to music programming with Jim Coley in for uh, Jim Bannon. Today from 1 to 3, followed by Nancy C. Hosting the Wednesday Traffic Jam from 3 to 6 p.m., at which point our terrific Wednesday night block of Latin music kicks in for, the, for this evening on WNF. As for next week, uh, next Wednesday, July 10th, I'll be joined by Tracy Callahan Molnar, whose therapy dog Beacon helped calm the nerves of gymnasts at the U.S. Olympic trials last week. There are other therapy dogs being used at the trials and elsewhere, kind of as a result, but Beacon was first, so we'll, we'll speak with Tracy, possibly with Beacon, next Wednesday here on Talking Animals on WNF. I also invite you to uh, visit TalkAnimals.net for audio archives of every show we've ever broadcast, and social media links are there, too. It's all TalkAnimals.net. You can also sign up to uh, for our little newsletter to find out about our guests a couple of days before and other news from the Talking Animals world. I'm Duncan Strauss. Thanks very much for listening. Have a good week. Be kind to animals. Be kind to others. Be kind to yourself. This is Talking Animals on WMNF Tampa. Brandon, Clearwater, Largo, Wiki Wachi, and beyond. NPR News headlines come in momentarily and then the conversation. See you next Wednesday on Talking Animals on WMNF. Thanks. Mm-hmm.